we did bond. Here's a closing statement. Creationists believe eyes, hearts, brains, lungs, livers, kidneys, whales, bald eagles, everything living is a result of design, not chance. We believe matter and energy do not originate from nothing by natural means. These are not religious beliefs. I believe them to be scientific beliefs. Life only comes from life. Bacteria makes bacteria. Apes make apes. People make people. Suppose I was a tour guide. I had 100 million smart Chinese people with me, but they never knew anything about Mount Rushmore. And I pointed to it, and I said, that got there over billions of years of time, nature, and chance. I'm willing to think not too many of them would believe me. They'd look at that and say, no, that's way too complex. And I could lose my job as a tour guide. So I get another job. Well, well first, I gotta, I'm glad I have that slide up there. They have no bias to the origins of a stone face on the side of Mount Rushmore. They'd say, there's no way that could have happened by chance. Somebody designed that. So suppose I lose my job. I'm teaching anatomy at UCLA. And I'm teaching the class, your human eye with the muscles, the blood vessels, the retina, the cornea, the optic nerve, is the result of millions and millions of years of beneficial mutation and natural selection. Chance. How long would I keep my job at UCLA? Forever. <laughs> the reason? I think there's a bias against design. A tour guide loses his job for teaching that. But I feel the eye is infinitely more complex than anything on Mount Rushmore. What should be taught in the science class? Science. How's that sound? When it comes to the, like, like they could talk forever about how the eye works. Then they could say, okay, new chapter. Now we're going to discuss the origins of the eye. Okay, that's history more than science, but it's still very important. The science talks about how the eye works. Then you can talk about the origins. I feel a supernatural designer is a much better explanation. Now, I am not labeling anybody in this room, but I've talked to many atheists and evolutionists over the years, and I have never really met one who said, you know, Bill, it makes sense to me that 60,000 miles of blood vessels happen by chance. I like to befriend these people. I've befriended many professors, and there's different reasons where they reach their conclusion. I think it's because of a, a bias. And again, there's many reasons. I'm not labeling anyone. The hardcore people who really want to sue you if you even think about talking about design, I've befriended them. Bitterness due to suffering and pain and grief. It's like, God, where were you when I needed you? And their whole life is fighting God, and I know that's not uh, Andrew. This was me. When did I become an evolutionist? At 14. At 14, the active hormones kicked in. I had this Bible here, and I'm being honest. I had this Bible here telling me what to do. My flesh doesn't want to do that. I was wavering. I got taught the theory of evolution. I said, hallelujah, brother, amen. I'm not listening to those rules in the Bible anymore. I'm going to do what I want. So I'm only pointing the finger at me on that one. Pride. We want to be the boss, right? I like to say the problem is, is that God has the remote control, right? We want the remote control. We want to be bosses. So some people dis discount that God does not exist. Peer pressure. You could lose your job, your career, if you even question the theory of evolution. And that's not academic inquiry at all. This one breaks my heart. The only thing they've been taught. Why wouldn't I be an evolutionist until I was 26? I never heard a counter theory to it. And when I did, I dove into it and felt that I had not been taught both sides, which is truth. Anti-religion. We learned about religion in high school. We learned about the Crusades and burning witches, the Inquisition, etc. I don't want anything to do with that. Once again, I hope you're not religious. I hope you're a seeker of truth. And apathy. A lot of people don't care. They care about their career, which is important, their family, etc. They're not thinking about God. They're just thinking about their world here. Well, I'm going to like to share with you why this is important. That's a picture of my daughter. Guess how old she was? <laughs> Two. Very good. That's her when she was three. She got leukemia. We went to Chalk Hospital for six months. We saw 12 kids who died. I went to six funerals. I saw a casket of a tiny little pink uh, casket. Uh, I saw a, a baby girl who turned skin, turned dark blue because her blood couldn't carry oxygen. I heard kids screaming in pain all night. I was mad at God. I could never, though, be an atheist. When I was worried about my daughter dying, I saw precious kids dying. Although I was emotionally mad at God, I could never be an atheist. 60,000 miles of blood vessels, 100 billion miles of DNA. I'd say, help me through these times, because I'm pretty mad at you. 
November 23rd, 2001, she gets a fungus on her lungs with no immune system. I was outraged at God. I was furious. But a big thing happened that can change your life. I was so mad at God, this is what I did. I said, you know what? You're in charge. You made everything. You made the universe. You made my daughter. If she dies, that's up to you. If she lives, that's up to you. We're going to do everything we can with science, medicine, technology, research, and prayer. But if she dies, what? That's up to you. Why is creation important? It can make you thankful for what you have. Look at your hands, everybody. Did you earn them? These are gifts. You ever said thanks for these gifts? Creation can make you humble. That's where we should be. She's sick. You all have problems in life. You're in charge. May your will be done with the problem. And with thankfulness and humility, you can have the secret to life, peace. Happiness is not the secret to life. You can never be happy unless you have peace. When your head hits the pillow, if you don't have peace, you can't be happy. Creation can make you thankful, humble, which leads to peace. And that's what truth can do for you. My daughter survived. She's the big one. She's six foot tall, 13 years old. Yes, she plays basketball and volleyball. But if she died, I should still be here saying, what a great creator we have, right? But many people fall away because of the trials you're all going to meet in life. Creation can keep your faith strong. Question when it comes to creation evolution. Are you going to believe an idea or are you going to believe your eyes? The end. Thank you. I'm going to end with just uh, four slides. I want to go back to this because uh, this idea of whales, uh, the bacteria to whales keeps coming up again and again. And so I feel like I need to emphasize this one more time before we wrap up tonight. Bacteria do not evolve directly into whales. Bacteria evolve into multicellular but relatively simple forms of life. We have lots of evidence in... Uh, some of the early protists for the evolution from single cells to multicellularity. And from there, we go through various stages, eventually getting through fishes, amphibians, cats, uh, mammals, your second cousins, and so forth. Although th through all these different stages, it's not a linear phase. It's, you know, the complexity of life evolves step by step from the last common ancestor. It doesn't evolve all at once. It's not an irreducibly complex problem. So that's point one. Point two, uh, the laws of thermodynamics, the origin of the universe, these issues come up. You know, this really is peripheral to the central issue of evolutionary biology. The origin of life, again, that's an issue for astrophysics, right? It really has nothing to do with the reality of biological evolution. The origin of life is an interesting problem. I don't think we have all the answers. I feel reasonably confident that at some point we'll experimentally be able to come up with an extremely plausible model that everybody will believe, but we don't have it yet. But again, that has nothing to do with the evolution of biological diversity after that original point. So that's the first thing I wanted to emphasize. Second. There are lots of ways that we can get complexity without a designer. Okay, so here is a design. It's a regular geometric design. Obviously, someone made this. We look at cracks in mud. We look at cooling lava patterns. We see complex geometric designs, some of them very regular, that did not require a designer per se. We started off with uh, the, uh, the, the stones on the sidewalk, right? If I go to a river, there's going to be a gradation from small stones to large stones depending on the flow. That's order. That's complexity. They're there in order from small to large depending on the flow, depending on how often this bank floods. That's not disorder. That's a natural process producing order in the way that these stones are arranged by size. Crystals, this is order from a non-biological process. So by itself, complexity doesn't require a designer. That is the second thing I want to emphasize. The third, you know, I just have to keep coming back to this. We have so many examples of transitional fossils. We have so many examples of transitional forms within living species. 
We have so many examples from genetics and developmental biology of how we can move step to step throughout this evolutionary process. A again, these are a few of the ones I used. You know, an interesting thing, when we talked about the evolution of kind, if we were gonna say that uh, families were created by God, and then within families or some equivalent group of animals, evolution occurred, even within this group of animals, you know, the mollusks, we see evolution of an eye, step by step. There's a plausible theoretical model, and we see all of the intermediate stages represented in living organisms. Speciation, again, within the fossil record, one thing we do agree on that uh, not all creationists do, in some cases documented for certain species in great detail throughout evolutionary transitions, and we see uh, evidence for speciation within living organisms, but you know, I have to come back to this diagram again. So here we are at the end, and it's, it's really not a scientific debate. It's a philosophical issue. If you believe literally in the truth of Genesis, and I assume we're talking about Genesis 1, because as those of you who are Bible scholars know, the story in Genesis 1 and the story in Genesis 2 don't quite add up, so I assume we're talking about Genesis 1, then... There's nothing that I'm going to say. It's not really a debate, right? There's nothing I'm going to say here that's going to change your mind. There's no evidence that anyone's going to present if you accept that as being true, and, and that's fine. But, it, but it's, it's really a philosophical issue. It's not a scientific issue. That There's no evidence that anyone will present to shake your faith. But again, for myself, for most of us who are scientists, the idea that religion and science occupy complementary areas of knowledge. They complement one another. They're not competing in any way. They're explaining different things about truth with a capital T is what we generally believe in. So.